This is the lecture for John uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 30. That's uh, lesson number 17. Let us pray. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, um, we pray now as we open up this uh, passage in the Gospel of John that you would um, help us to uh, really see and appreciate the great love that uh, your son Jesus has expressed for all your disciples and a love that uh, is shown in, in the great humility that he has provided and the example of uh, humble servanthood that he provides to us. Um, and we pray, Lord, that um, that example would find traction in our lives, help us to, uh, to uh, serve in the same way uh, and do so for your glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Well, every society throughout history has um, had class distinctions. It's the way that sinful man decides who is important and who is not, the haves and the have-nots. At different times, these determinations were made in different ways. In ancient cultures, it was decided by who was the fiercest warrior or who was the best hunter. In 17th century Europe, it was determined by nobility. Today, it's determined by wealth or athletic prowess or, or even physical beauty. No matter how you do it, all societies make these class distinctions. But on the last night of the Lord's life, the Son of God demonstrated that the body of believers that would be born out of his death on the cross uh, would not be like that. When Jesus, who is the highest in authority, took the lowest of positions, he taught us that his church his kingdom would be different. In a church where Jesus is the head, there aren't important people and unimportant people. There are not Jews or Gentiles, rich or poor, free or slave. We're all the same before God. In doing so, in doing away with these class distinctions, God has done away with human pride. There's no place for it in the kingdom of God. We who are chosen by God are servants of Jesus Christ and are servants of one another. Tonight we're going to learn from Jesus' example that we are called to serve and that doing so leads us, leads to great blessings. We've got three divisions for you in our passage this evening. Uh, first of all, we can see that Jesus washes his disciples' feet. That's the verse, first 11 verses. Humble service is only possible, then, for those who experience salvation. And then Jesus teaches the truth behind his example. That's verses 12 to 17. And what we'll learn here is that in God's economy, self-sacrifice for others will ultimately lead to great blessings from God. And then Jesus predicts his betrayal, verses 18 to 30. Here, Jesus' example of serving even to uh, uh, Judas um, and do so to the very end inspires us to patiently serve even those who offend us. It will be a hard assignment. And so, again, my goal uh, is to impress upon each of you that humble service to Jesus is it's Jesus' example and our duty, but it leads to great joy and fulfillment. So if you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 13. Um, in the first century, Israel was crisscrossed with dusty, dirty roads and paths. And the people wore open leather uh, sandals. And by the end of the day, their feet were, at, were absolutely filthy. And because they ate in a reclined position, it was important to wash their feet. The average Jew washed his own feet. If there were slaves in the household, they, they performed the task. If households, in households where there were multiple slaves, well, there, there would be a hierarchy. Washing feet fell to the lowest of slaves. Our passage begins with an awkward scene. Everyone was reclining around the table. The meal was served and everyone had dirty feet. You certainly couldn't expect one of the disciples to do uh, the, the task for the rest. Uh, according to Luke's account, that's chapter 22, verse 24, the disciples had been arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And so in verse 4, Jesus got up, took off his outer garment, and wrapped a towel around his feet. 
He poured water into a basin and went around one by one, washing their feet. If the scene had previously been awkward, now it was downright uncomfortable. And as a task, foot washing was below that, uh, that which a student would be expected to perform for his teacher. Again, it was a slave's job. But here, the teacher, the Son of God, was performing the task on his students. When Jesus got to Simon Peter, he, Peter, that is Peter, asked, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Just as the disciples didn't understand why Jesus had to go to the cross, they didn't understand this act either. And this act was consistent with the cross. Jesus responded by gently telling Peter that while he didn't understand, later he would. Instead of trusting, Peter responded as Peter often did, inappropriately. Emphatically, he said, no, you shall never wash my feet. Peter must have been everyone's favorite there among the 12. The rest never had to ask that dumb question or embarrass themselves. All they had to do was wait, and Peter would do it for them. And that's why I, Peter's been referred to as the patron saint of those who stick their feet in their mouths. Jesus answered in verse 8, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. If this was only about what was socially acceptable, then Jesus' response seems a bit much. But when we understand the symbolism, it takes on a whole new light. Unless the Lamb of God takes away our sins, that is, he washes us, we have no part with him. That phrase, having a, a part, was used by the Jews in terms of inheritance. To have a part with him is to belong to Jesus Christ or to be a member of God's family. How much Peter understood is not clear, but he loved Jesus very much and he desired to be with him. And this is seen with his enthusiastic desire to have all of himself washed then. What do we learn then about humble service from Jesus' example? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we learn that humble service begins with the church. John says in verse 1, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. These were the ones that the Father had given him. Jesus does love the world, but he loves these best. He, Jesus loves his church first, and then that love radiates out to the rest of the world. We've already seen in our study that miracles don't produce real faith. If, our, if you read the early chapters in the book of Acts, you'll notice an interesting characteristic about the church. While the apostles did perform miracles, what really drew the people to Christ was the love that those first believers had for one another. When the church demonstrates the, the, this humility rooted in love for one another, then the world is strangely attracted to us. And that's because they have nothing like that. The love of God is revealed in the humble service of people like you and me, teaching Sunday school classes, baking casseroles for folks, driving elderly to their doctor's appointments. Yes, we can and should practice humble service outside the body of Christ too, but it begins first within the church. Humble service has nothing to do with low self-esteem either. Verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew that his Father had given him authority over all things. He knew he was divine. His home was in heaven and he was going to return there. Make no mistake about it, Jesus was no doormat. And the reason he did it was to demonstrate in, God, in God's kingdom, the more powerful you are, the more you use your power for the good of others. Humble service, then, is, all, is motivated by love. Verse 1 says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed the full extent of his love. Jesus had loved these men. They were one, the ones that the Father had given to him. And by washing their feet, he demonstrated his love at a whole new level. And the ne next day, he would 
take it to an even greater level by dying on the cross. And listen to what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. He said who, about, about Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by coming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's love. Humble service, then, is a high calling from God. Peter didn't want Jesus to wash his feet. He, he, he thought he was unworthy to have his feet washed by Jesus. And in that respect, he was right. But he also thought Jesus was too important to be washing his feet. And in that respect, he was wrong. Peter thought Jesus was so talented. He was a great speaker. He taught with authority like no other. He performed miracles. He was destined for big things. What Peter didn't realize was that to God, humble service is a big deal. And then the most important point concerning humble service is our first principle. And that is that regeneration is the prerequisite for humble service. In verse 10, Jesus talked of two types of cleansing. He said, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. Jesus was speaking of the cleansing that only he can and will do. To be bathed by Christ is to be washed in his blood, receiving forgiveness for his sins. We only need this washing once. And yet, after we are saved, we still sin. And that's where the other cleansing comes in. Jesus' foot washing is symbolic of the daily cleansing that we gain by confessing our sins and receiving forgiveness from him. It is the result of repentance. Ultimately, it is a, a cleansing uh, of our selfish pride. And the fact that it is a daily process makes it symbolic of our sanctification. Jesus is providing an example for us, and we are to follow it. But we can't follow it until we are clean. Jesus' example of service applies only to his disciples. Uh, unless we are first indebted, indebted to him for our salvation, we will never understand his call to service. It is his salvation that prepares us for such service. In Philippians 2, Paul calls us to have the same mindset as Jesus. That is, to imitate his humility. And so the question I have for you is, how have you been displaying Jesus' mindset? In other words, how are you imitating him by taking the low place? You and I will never be able to do it unless we are first truly his people, truly saved. Now, when Jesus had finished washing all their feet, he dressed and took his place. And he asked them whether they understood his actions. And it seems clear that they did not. So he set out to explain, further explain his actions. And we see that beginning in verse 13. He said, uh, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. As their teacher and Lord, Jesus was in a much higher position than his disciples. And yet he was the one who served them. Since he was their superior, there was no reason why they shouldn't obey him. And his point being here that humble service is not an option. It is a commandment. With was this a commandment to literally practice the ritual of foot washing? There have been Christian communities over the years that have practiced this rite 
as a sacrament on par with baptism or even communion. But this was not likely Jesus' intent. Foot washing does not appear to be a rite that was practiced by the early church. There's only one place in the New Testament where foot washing is even mentioned, and that is in 1 Timothy 5.10. And there it is listed as a general mark of hospitality. A good host was one who provided for the foot washing of their guests. The heart of this teaching is humility. Before our brothers and sisters in Christ, to practice ritual foot washing without the spirit of humility would be to miss the point. Note that this command has nothing to do with spiritual gifts. Jesus' call to service applies to all disciples. We cannot use the excuse that our spiritual gift is teaching to get out of serving others. Think of the Good Samaritan. I don't know whether he had the gift of mercy or not, but he did know that when his neighbor was in trouble, he had to do something about it. It had been my experience that these acts of mercy are never convenient. That is that they never fit nicely into our schedules. Acts of service, acts of mercy are acts of worship. Last week we learned that worship comes at a cost to the worshiper. And we all need to give something up to set something aside that we want to do. Humble service then is self-sacrifice for the purpose of meeting other people's needs. Back to Philippians 2, Paul calls us not to be proud, but in humility, consider others better than ourselves. We should look for the interests of, of others first and then ours afterwards. Their needs are more important than ours. Their opinions may be better than ours. Another point is that we are to humbly serve all within the church. Did you notice when Jesus served his disciples? Was it uh, when they were being nice and polite and lovable? No. Judas was about to betray him. Peter was about to deny him. And the others had been arguing over who was the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus loved these men when they were absolutely unlovable. And that, I think, is one of the most encouraging thoughts in this passage. I don't know what the Greek word for jerk is, but that is what these guys were. And yet Jesus loved and served them. Jesus' followers don't get to choose who to serve and who not to serve. And yet my principle comes from the final verse in this passage, verse 17. And that is that humble service for God, for God uh, blesses the servant. Edwin Bloom says that God blesses his servants, not for what we know, but how we respond to what we know. In other words, God blesses obedience. It, let, let, let me give you an example. 35 years ago, I was approached by the president of um, my congregation. He, he asked me to become the church treasurer. At the time, the current treasurer had accepted a new job and he was moving away to Minnesota. Now, you might think that being a treasurer is not a big deal, and it's not that big a deal, but, but in our church, we had a preschool, we had a school, day school, and one of the responsibilities of the treasurer was to take care of the payroll for 40 employees, not to mention paying all the bills and balancing the accounts and preparing all the reports. Now, you would think that my job as the treasurer was basically that of a bookkeeper. And what I learned was it was not. I was a servant of God. And when I figured that out, being a treasurer went from being a burden to being a blessing. As treasurer, I was in a position to help the pastor and the principal, school principal. And neither of them wanted to be burdened with the financial details. Our pastor wanted to shepherd the flock, and the principal wanted to be freed up to lead her staff. And in serving them and helping them so they could focus on what they were best at, God richly blessed me. I learned skills that I was able to use in my career. I was greatly fulfilled in my service, and I loved that job. But that only happened when I focused on meeting other people's needs.
So my question for you, how are you experiencing the blessings of servanthood? It does not matter what our assignments are in church, whether we're an elder, a deacon, an usher, Sunday school teacher, we are all servants of God. And when we come to that realization, it is then that God begins to bless us. Now, having taught that obedience in the form of service leads to blessings, Jesus then informed his disciples that there would be no blessings for one. And that be, we see that in verse 18. He says, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill, fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Jesus had selected all 12 of his disciples. So we wonder, it's a natural question is, was his selection of Judas a mistake? Well, was it a lapse in judgment? Well, I think the answer is no. Jesus selected Judas to accomplish God's purposes and to fulfill prophecy. And he quoted David from Psalm 41, 9. You may recall a story back in 2 Samuel 15, David was betrayed by his trusted friend, Ahithophel. When David's son Absalom attempted to take his father's throne, his advisor, Ahithophel, conspired in the rebellion. And so in the same way, Judas, was, who was Jesus' close companion, also would betray him. Jesus had long known Judas' heart, but Judas was still responsible. Jesus revealed his betrayal to the disciples for several reasons. In verse 19, he said he was telling them in advance so that when it happened, they would believe that I am he. One of the great purposes of prophecy is to strengthen our faith. We come to know that our God knows and controls the future. And I think Jesus revealed his betrayal for the very purpose of letting Judas know as well. It was an act of grace on his part. In effect, Jesus said, now you know that I know. It was an opportunity for Judas to change his mind. Now, I doubt that Judas intended to betray Jesus from the very beginning. He probably started out sincerely following Jesus. But just as most Jews fell away from Jesus when he did not live up to their expectations, so I think it was probably true for Judas. Maybe he thought that following Jesus would lead to a nice cabinet position when Jesus became king. His control of the money bag and his habit of dipping into the funds revealed a selfish attitude. He had many chances along the way. Grace was showered upon him for the entirety of, of, the entirety of Jesus' ministry. He spent three years in close company with the Son of God, hearing his words, seeing his miracles, experiencing his affection. Along the way, Judas made a whole lot of little bad decisions that led up to one fatal big one. Back in verse 2, John wrote that Judas had also been prompted by Satan. All those bad choices had been, made him susceptible to the temptation of the devil. In verse 20, Jesus contrasted his close connection with the rest of the disciples. He contrasted it against Judas' betrayal. There is no mission of greater importance than representing Christ to the world. It carries with it the authority of Jesus and the authority of God the Father. Judas rejected and betrayed Jesus. Later, others would reject and betray the disciples. And our response to those who come in the name of Christ is the same as if we are responding directly to God. Very serious. Previously, Jesus had referred to his betrayal indirectly, but then he became troubled and spoke frankly to them. He said, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. 
I love the way John describes their reaction. He says, they stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. In the, the 12 had lived with the Lord like a family and yet they had no idea. So concealed was Judas and his intentions. When eating their meals during the feast, the Jews reclined around low tables and they would lay at an angle toward the table Resting on their left elbow, they would feed themselves with their right hands. In this orientation, each one would have his head near the chest of the man to the left. In verse 23, it says, The disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him. This would be the apostle John. Simon Peter was not in a position to ask Jesus directly about his betrayer, so he asked John to do it. And John, in turn, Lean back and ask Jesus. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And at that he gave the sop to Judas. Why John didn't react at that moment, we don't know. Jesus had loved Judas all the way to the end. It's believed that Judas was sitting to Jesus' left, which was a place of honor. For Jesus to give him that morsel of food was also an honor. So Jesus was given, Judas was given every opportunity to confess his sins and repent. But instead, Judas rejected his last chance. And when he did, John says that Satan entered into him. What, what a terrible thought to, to have Satan take up residence within a person's heart. Once that happened, he was told, what you are about to do, do quickly. And of course, the other disciples were unaware of his real intent. John says he went out, and it was night. The Passover occurs during the full moon, but John uses the image of darkness to describe what Judas had done. Jesus is the light, and by leaving his presence, Judas went out into the darkness. So let me give you the principle. And that is that humble servants are patient toward others, even those who oppose them. It is amazing that Jesus was so loving and patient toward Judas. For three years, they were together, all along knowing that Ju Judas would betray him. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus taught that uh, one night an enemy, some enemy planted weeds in a farmer's field. His servants discovered the vandalism and told the farmer. They asked him if they should remove the weeds, and he told them no. To pull the weeds while the wheat was still developing would harm the wheat. Instead, he told them to wait until the harvest, when the reaper would separate the good from the bad. Judas was a weed, but he was such a clever weed that no one but Jesus knew. Today, there are weeds in the church that look so much like wheat that we cannot tell. And I suppose there are wheat that look a little like weeds too. It's not our job to sort the weeds from the wheat. Only Jesus knows the hearts of men. Our task then is to follow his example and patiently serve all in the church, just as Jesus did. This lesson is an important one for me. Over the years, there have been a number of individuals in my church that I was darn sure were weeds. To be very frank, I would have dearly loved to uproot those weeds. But Jesus' example is that we must love all people, love those people and show them the same grace and mercy that we show to those that we like. Such an approach differentiates us from the world. And so I ask you, how about you? Is there a Judas in your life? It's so easy to be judgmental and withhold our affections. But this is not Jesus' example. Jesus was reaching out to Judas right up to the very end. And he gave him every opportunity to repent. In fact, if we look back on our own lives, we will realize just how patient he has been with us. And knowing that, we must be patiently serving those in our midst, even those who may oppose us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what, a, what an amazing and challenging example you have provided us.
to be humble servants to, to all people, even those who, who may oppose us. Um, and yet it is a high calling. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would um, move in all of our hearts, that in whatever circumstances you have for us, that you would um, cause us to be humble servants for you, pointing others to Christ, blessing them, and in turn being blessed for our uh, selfless service. It's in Christ's name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.